All right, we are live. Welcome everybody to Hump Day Hangouts, episode 186. Uh, before we dive into things real quick, I want to say hi to the guys. Uh, we've got almost everybody here. Uh, if you're watching this, we've got a lovely picture of Chris, I believe, on the page since he couldn't be here live. Uh, but we'll go down the row here and say hello to everybody real quick. Hernan, how's it going, man? Hey guys, can I? I'm out and about, but I wanted, I didn't want to miss it. So. Fair enough. All right, short and sweet. Uh, Marco, how's the weather, man? Weather's always good in Costa Rica. It's it's warm and raining or war, warm and sunny. No other option. Nice. Wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> awesome, Bradley. How you doing, man? Um, neck deep in uh, content production. I've been adding a bunch of content to the local GMB pro course yesterday and today finally got back to doing the con uh, prospecting module inside of the mastermind, which I'm so glad to be back working on that again. So uh, like for two days, I've been recording videos <laughs> and training, which I enjoy that stuff in case you didn't know. So uh, it's good to be back to working on all that stuff again. So I'm happy to be here and answer some questions as well. Nice. Well, I saw the very top of your shirt. Uh, is that what shirt I think it is? Oh, yeah. This is. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Look, let's, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple ways to get those shirts. Uh, if uh, We're actually going to be coming out with some new and improved stuff soon, so stay tuned for that. Um, as well, if you are new to Semantic Mastery and you're watching Hump Day Hangouts, or this is one of the first times you've uh, watched this, first of all, thank you for watching. Uh, we appreciate everybody who checks it out, whether you're lurking and learning or you're actively asking questions. Um, but, you know, wherever you're watching from, you can always ask questions earlier by going to the event page, um, semanticmastery.com slash HD questions, popping questions on. You can watch replays. There's a lot of ways to get a ton of value out of these. And if you haven't yet and you're new to us, we always recommend you start with the battle plan. Just go to battleplan.semanticmastery.com. Now, speaking of where to start, a little further down the road, uh, we had a launch this past week with local GMB Pro. Um, went over really well. People have had some awesome results. I mean, obviously, if you've seen the sales page, of course we put the testimonials on there, but we've continued to hear good stuff from people. And again, it's not just us who are having these results. Uh, but not only that, uh, Marco, I believe there's some more stuff coming out for the people who joined and are, are part of the local GMB Pro group, right? Actually, we're currently, I, I did, I recruited 10, 10, it's going to end up 10 to 15 beta testers for our Google GMB auto poster and then the image renamer and, and exit data optimizer, if that's what you want to call it, uh, spamation at its best. Uh, we're also, <laughs> we've also got the, the, the YouTube views going. We we're beta testing that. Guys, we're, we're just a couple of weeks away from making it available to, to everyone. So, so anyone that wants part of this, Stay tuned, stay abreast of everything. We're training the local GMB VA, the Duffy. I've been so busy that, that, that I'm kind of, you know, like Bradley, he's, he's producing content. I'm in the background trying to, try to, trying to put everything together, right? Trying to get all of the software out, trying to train people, trying to stay abreast of the beta testers. We're going to have a webinar on Monday uh, to show them how to do the GMB auto posting. That's going to be part of the training, right? The, the, the videos that, that come with the auto poster that has a little bit higher learning curve. YouTube is pretty straightforward. You go in, you place your URL, you choose where you want it to go or where you want to draw people from, and it just goes and, and it gets you views. Real people. Real people. Did I say that enough? It's real fucking people. <laughs> okay, you heard it first. I'm not entirely... I'm not entirely sure what, what you said, Marco. Was it real people? Was it bot? <laughs> Let me repeat that now. <laughs> G-rated, man. This is the public event. <laughs> Good deal. Bradley, I know you've been busy in there, too, getting a, a lot of content and the training and all that in there. Um, so, you know, thank you personally for that <laughs> as well. And I know everyone's happy about that. Yeah, you know, my only regret is that uh, – it, it, you know, launching these products is great. It, it, you know, the method is fantastic. It's, um, it works really well. What sucks is that it's, ta it's taken me away from some of the mastermind training for a couple of weeks while I was working on content and we're far from complete with the training guys. We're still adding a lot to it. So, uh, don't, don't think that what's there is it. There's, uh, I've got more training I'm adding. I'll probably add several more videos tomorrow. I added a bunch of stuff yesterday to the local GMB pro members area. And then we've got several update webinars coming up. 
So just keep in mind, there'll be more and more content being added. Um, like I said, I was just, uh, I'm glad to be able to start kind of pulling back a little bit from that and start working on some of the other content um, and doing, you know, cause I've got a lot of stuff that we've got to get, get out for you guys, for our members. And uh, so just bear with us while we do it, guys. Everything that we're coming out with has been tried, trued, and tested. So there's there's a reason why sometimes it, there's a little bit of a delay in getting getting published or getting out to you guys. If, awesome. If I can just add to, to, to what, what Bradley just said, I, and I posted this in Facebook, we're scratching the surface right now of what's possible. All, all that we have right now is what, what we've been working with, right? The, the, the local GMB optimizing, the image manipulation and uh activity activity inside the, the gmb ecosystem but you guys know that we have a whole bunch of products a whole bunch of courses that we can, and that we use ourselves that we haven't implemented on this we we had a, a testimonial just recently a day day before yesterday 170 calls a day in the uh, excuse me, 170 calls a month in the dental niche guys 170 calls a month. That that dentist is knee deep in teeth. Yeah. Yeah. And one other thing I just want to mention about it. Like, for example, um, yesterday I started the silo training in there. And uh, so one of the things I'm going to be doing over the next couple of days is finishing the silo training and showing how to boost that using press releases, which is exactly what Marco was talking about, was integrating some of the other methods that we use to kind of help supercharge the results, which, uh, you know, so essentially this will be kind of a kind of a uh, integration between local GMB pro and local PR pro to help get better, even better results or quicker results. So I'm going to be going over that within the next couple of days. If not, um, if not by the end of this week, by the beginning of next week, I'll have that content added. And then one other thing I'm going to be doing is setting up some AdWords, uh, you know, some AdWords campaigns to be able to generate some additional traffic into the GMB pro ecosystem essentially. And so there will be some some slight AdWords training in there, guys, for how to how to use that for local GMB Pro methods as well. So that's what Marco was saying is like, you know, so far all the training is just about being inside the GMB dashboard, and you can still accomplish or get results from staying within the GMB dashboard and not integrating other services. However, we're going to give you guys all the stuff that we test that works that produces results, and that includes backlinking, other traditional SEO stuff. Um, sending traffic, including PPC traffic, you know, all different kinds of things that we're going to be adding into the training uh, to be used in tandem with the local GMB Pro exclusive methods, if that makes sense. So again, there's lots and lots of additional content. It was only a one-time purchase price. It's not a recurring, but we're still going to be adding more content to it as we develop out more of these methods. Sweet. All right. Anybody else last call? And then uh, we're going to jump into it here. Going once, going twice. All right, let's get into the questions. Did you tell everybody to subscribe to our YouTube channel? Yeah. Hey, everybody. <laughs> subscribe to the YouTube channel <laughs> uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, we do put out other content, and it's a great way to stay up to date on Hangouts because we get it. You can't always make these live, or you ask a question, you're busy, something happens. But uh, yeah, do us and yourself a favor and subscribe on YouTube. Fantastic. All right. Yeah, if I might, if I might say that there's a. Uh, I don't know. There's a gold mine of information in that YouTube channel. So, and a lot of people are actually charging a lot of money for the information that you can find on YouTube. So go ahead and use. Um, as Marco usually says, go ahead and use the search function on YouTube. Uh, you know, before coming and asking your question here, like I don't know, I would say six times out of ten, you will find your answer there. You can still come and ask questions, but that's a that's a really powerful resource and it's free. It's there. You know. I see you guys updating YouTube Silo Academy videos in there. <laughs> In the channels, because somebody's in there doing that, and God Almighty, that was years ago, and I look like a different person now. <laughs> I'm seeing those videos, and I'm like, oh God, I need to re-record all of those because it. I'm half the man I used to be, literally. <laughs> uh, that's uh, some extra bonuses for some battle plan people. So people who get the battle plan bundle uh, are getting some extra special goodies when they uh, when they get in there. Well, all right, let's go ahead and get into questions. Can we do that? That's it. All right. Jenny is up. What's up, buddy? He's here often. He says, hello, fum, hel hello fellow hump dayers. 
hope everyone is super excellent. Quick question. With all the GDPR craziness, do we need to be applying this to our local lead gen sites? We operate in home repair niche in Florida and our customers come from a couple other states, people with vacation homes. Thoughts? Um, Chris and Hernan and Adam are the ones to answer that. I've done nothing with that. So what do you guys say? Yeah. And if I might, and there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of debate still on the GDPR side of things. And then there's Chris saying you hide with the wig and, you know, saying you cheers and whatnot on the um, Bradley screen. <laughs> so that's his response. But uh, in short, what you need to do is that just to put it, we're, uh, we're not lawyers. I'm not a lawyer. So you need to have that in mind. But what we found is that you need to make people aware that if you're giving them something, you need to have their express consent for them for you to market them something else, right? So for example, let's say that you're giving away something for free, like a free, I don't know, teeth whitening or something like that, right? To, to sweeten the deal. And you want to add a checkbox on whatever it is that you're doing, ClickBox, um, sorry, ClickFunnels or whatever. You want to add a checkbox, a checkbox over there that says, I also want to get um, marketing or promotional material from this company. You know, that's basically it. That's basically all you need to do right now to get to be compliant. With that said, there's a lot of still of debate going on. And personally, and this is 100% a personal opinion, don't, don't like, don't take it as advice. I think that they're going to go for the big dogs first. Because if you're just conducting normal business and getting, I don't know, a handful of leads, maybe, I don't know, 200 leads a month or something like that, you're, you're not even, you know, you're not even a target. So they're going to be going after the big uh, lead gen companies and everything like that before going. And then we will see how that develops before being, you know, completely structured on what we need to be doing in terms of GDPR. What do you think, Adam? Yeah, I think, too, the thing to keep in mind with this is, you know, hey, do, do the right thing. If you're doing something shady, if you're not saying people, telling people you're going to send them emails, things like that, you know, get that stuff in order. But the main thrust, uh, at least as again, as I understood it, because there's a lot of interpretation here of GDPR is to deal with data storage and privacy. It's, and then, and I realize on the sharp end of the stick for us, that usually comes down to how you handle emails. Um, but it, GDPR was not created to deal with people's lead magnet funnels or things like that. Um, it's more about, you know, what are you doing with that information? Can people get that information? Can they can they delete it from your system? That's what it's more about. Um, so just keep that in mind. But I'll, I agree with what Hernan was saying. Yeah, so my, my only advice would be like, for example, I don't know how to apply this yet, Jenia, to local stuff. I don't know where we need to apply it or when or how. So I'm just kind of waiting to let some of the dust settle and let the big guys figure it out. And then it'll trickle on down to the, the little old me. You know what I mean? So that that's basically what uh, why I don't have an answer for you on that. I know it's something that I will also need to be concerned about being in the local lead gen space as well. But it's not something that I'm going to worry about it uh, currently when it's still like a bunch of craziness, as you mentioned in your comment, because it really truly is. There's, it's a it's real foggy. It's murky right now. Not not I don't know of anybody that knows all the answers yet, but in time it will work itself out and then I'll start to implement whatever I need to at that point. But I'm not really super concerned at the moment because I don't do anything super spammy to email subscribers, um, at least not for local local stuff. Right. Um, so anyways, that that's my thought on it. Yeah, yeah, and I totally agree with you, Bradley. But one more thing that you need to have in mind is that whatever you're using, whatever tools that you're using to collect your emails, uh, you know, we usually go with Drip on, you know, Bradley's case, we use Active Campaign, we use ClickFunnels and whatnot. You need to make sure that whatever you're using, it, they are GDPR compliant, you know? So that's up to you as a, as a data manager to make sure that everyone that you're using Every you know service provider, your email autoresponder, your or your your landing page builder, whatever you're doing, is GDPR compliant. The good news is that most of the stuff, if not all of the stuff that we teach you guys or that we recommend, like ClickFunnels, Thrive, um, Active Campaign, Drip, you know the bigger the biggest uh, tools out there, they're already compliance with GDPR. So there's not a big deal over there. But if you have questions. Uh, about this and that provider, you can always reach out to them and tell them, hey guys, are you GDPR compliant? Because most of the big companies, they have already done them ho their homework because those are gonna be the big targets, you know? Right. Not, the, not, like, not the small guy, but for example, active campaign. You know, those that are handling, or click funnels that are handling millions of emails per, per month pretty much, so. 
go. All right, so if, if I can just clarify a point, because he's asked, he's asking a local lead gen site in Florida. The European Union cannot enforce a European law on U.S. soil unless you're targeting European Union members. And so as long as you're just within Florida and you have a legion or within the U.S., you could even go as far Latin America. There is no uh, GDPR law in Latin America. And so you could target that. At the moment that you start getting people from the EU for whatever reason, I don't see why you would in Florida, why someone in Germany would want your services in Florida since you're local. You can't go to Germany and, and service whatever it is that they want or France or whatever. Local, it, it, it doesn't apply. You're within the U.S. You're, you're bound by U.S. laws, not, not European Union. Now, as far as Semantic Mastery, this it's a global company. We accept people from all over the world, including the European Union, and so we have to abide by GDPR. And that's the, the distinct difference. It's whether it's within the boundaries of, of the European Union or if you're doing uh, financial transactions even if you're outside the european union you have to provide gdpr protection to that information so i hope yes. that clarifies it a little bit yeah i to i totally agree with marco as well i do see this as an effort you know i do see this as an effort or you know when you like even if you're not reach out because i totally agree with marco what marco is saying in terms of if you're doing business in south florida or something like that you are technically not reached by the GDPR, but I do think that not yet, but Facebook, AdWords, et cetera, et cetera, as they are asking you to have, you know, their privacy policy, et cetera, et cetera, on the footer to make your ads compliant and whatnot, they're going to start enforcing that. There's not happening that yet as of yet, but uh, I think that at some point that's coming and it has to do with, you know, being able to um, advertise on these platforms that we know that we're doing in terms of Facebook or, or, or AdWords. We need to be compliant because as Marco was saying, we get a lot of leads and a lot of people from Europe, but um, but it, it's coming at some point. So I think it's better to be prepared. I agree. All right, cool. Clickstar marketing's up. This is a uh, RYS question. Um, I don't know. I read through it. I don't know if this is something you want to answer, Marco, in a public setting, or if you want to direct him to the RYS Reloaded uh, Facebook group for that question. All right. Let, 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 no, I, I have it. Okay. Should I create? Oh, yeah. No. Yeah, I'm not going to get into how we do the folders and how we silo, how we do everything. Yeah, uh, I don't think that would be one you'd want to answer on uh, in a public setting. So. Clickstar Marketing, sorry, I don't know your real name off the top of my head, but um, I would direct you to ask that question, repost it in the RYS Reloaded um, members area, or the Facebook group, I mean, and Marco would be, or and or Rob would be happy to jump in and answer it there. Okay. Sorry, guys, that's one of those types of questions that we just can't answer here because it's revealing too much information from a one of our um, higher priced courses. So, Gordon, what's up, buddy? He's here almost every week now answering asking good questions he says hey i want to say a big thank you or a big and huge thank you again for the help you provide your customers on these hump days events well we truly enjoy it gordon it's funny but we had our uh corporate meeting yesterday which we do every week on tuesday and we were talking about several years down the road like what our plan is for semantic mastery and marco was talking about his age and his family and talking about how you know he doesn't want to constantly be in the lab developing new stuff and providing, you know, producing training and all that stuff. But one of the things that he says he would like to still do uh, far into the future is something hangouts. And, and I feel the same way. It's like, we're almost to our fourth year of, uh, you know, we're at episode, what, 186 today, I think it is. And uh, so we're only a, a handful of episodes away from being on our four, four year anniversary. So this is something that we truly enjoy. Um, it's kind of a way to give back. You guys have been good to us. We try to be good to you. And in this, in this public setting one one hour a week every single week so we certainly appreciate you coming and participating every week as well uh question number one if i correctly understand an answer that was given last week google allows us to add additional phone numbers to a gmb listing like a tracking number and to designate that additional number as the primary number that visitors see without any negative effects even though it does not match the nap phone number on cita citations right also, can visitors still see the actual nap number and if so how do they know they'll call the track how do we know they'll call the tracking number instead? I'm not 100% clear on that one. 
Um, Marco could probably give you an answer on that. I know you can add additional numbers and there is an AdWords tracking number or tracking extension or something like that inside GMB, but that's different. That's for if you're going to be using the local extent, um, location extension inside of AdWords. So you can designate a specific tracking number there so that you can have call analytics through that one number, right? So that's something that's displayed via an ad. Um, as far as the numbers like as part of the NAP, I know you can add additional numbers. So you can have a, you know, the primary number and then you can have secondary numbers, but I'm not sure how you can designate one over the other or if that affects NAP. So Marco, what are your, what is your take on that? Yes, you can absolutely make uh, another number, the primary number. Uh, that of course is going to affect your NAP. So you're going to need uh, NAP cleanup. Now you can eliminate the second number. You don't have to keep the second number. That's not going to change any, anything since there's still a primary number there. Again, what that will change is, is the NAP. If you don't want people to see the, 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 the client's, right, your, your SEO client's number, then you want them to see your tracking number, then you're going to have to display your number. What I do is I display several numbers and then like to kind of bury the, the client's number, if they insist on having their number under, which I don't see why they would, but you know, you might get into that where a client demands it. Uh, if you don't want to lose that number for whatever reason, you, you can still leave it on there. But yes, you can absolutely change the primary number. Do we have an example somewhere where I, I cause be honest, I've never seen a GMB, like a, like a Google maps listing that displayed more than one phone number. I've never seen that at least that I can remember. Do we have an example of that somewhere like where they, or, or does Google only display one number, which is what I've always seen. It, it could be that Google displays only one number, but you, you're, a, you can add several numbers. So I don't, I, yeah, I would have to go is, my question would be then what he's asking, I think is if, if you use a tracking number, but you add the actual NAP number, like from the, from, you know, so the business's main phone number, um, but you add that as a secondary number and Google displays the tracking number. Although they are Google GMB is aware of the other number, if all of these citations out there have the um, original number, but the NA the the tracking number is displayed in Maps, does that affect? Does that cause NAP issues? Is what I'm saying. Do we know it? Do we know an answer to that? I've never tested that. No, so. no, not, not a direct answer with, with whether it'll cause issues, but but just, just think, Google knows that that the other number is there. Right. But. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, we, we have to test that. that. That's a hell of a test. Yeah, it is because you could you could literally tank a uh, you know a, a maps listing if if it does affect or cause NAP issues. I I get what you're saying, Marco, and it makes sense to me. Which is if 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 both numbers are added to GMB to the Google My Business dashboard, then Google knows that that secondary number which might not be displayed is uh in the 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 maps listing, but Google understands that it's connected with the business, so it it logically it shouldn't cause any nap issues if the if the primary uh non-tracking number was used in citations one of the things i can mention about this to maybe shed a little bit of light on here um was from google help uh one of the one of the one of my uh clients has two locations and both of their locations it was a pre, it's a preschool both of their locations had their um physical address shown incorrectly like essentially you should go to the u.s postal service your usps.com in the united states and they have a, a zip code finder or whatever and basically you can enter in an, an address and it will give you the standardization like the address formatted in the usps united states postal service approved formatting right so it'll give you like the standard address formatting the way that it should be and so one of the things I always do for my clients is I go in and double check what they give me as their address with how the USPS shows it as the standardized address. And if there's an inconsistency, which typically a lot of the times, more often than not, there is an inconsistency, I will end up updating the Google, the GMB address to match what the US Postal Service says should be the correct formatting. And then if, if it requires it, I'll go out and, and start a, a citation cleanup job to amend or update all of the citations that are published to show the correct formatting of the address. So one, the reason I'm telling you this is because I contacted uh, the, the pre, one of the 
the two locations in the preschool, I had to update both of those addresses in GMB to the correct formatting because they were listed incorrectly, right? Um, which was because the business owner had set it up the wrong way. So I standardized the addresses. I updated both of them, but one location did not display the updated address. In other words, both locations updated in the dashboard. And if you want to go view the public maps listing, one location showed the updated address format, you know, for, uh, updated format, address formatting, excuse me. The other location didn't show. It still showed displayed the old formatting. Although in the dashboard, if you clicked info and then you clicked edit, um, the, you know, the info for that business, the NAP was listed correctly, saved correctly inside of DMB, but the displayed address was still the old address, which was the incorrect formatting. So I contacted GMB help about it or support. And, uh, one of the support techs ended up replying back to me and saying, oh no, if as long as it's correct in the GMB dashboard, the display doesn't matter. Google will associate whatever NAP uh, pub, you know, NAP mentions out on the web what, with what is saved in the dashboard. Now, keep in mind, Google support reps sometimes don't always tell us the truth, maybe because they don't know themselves. So I'm not sure that that was 100% accurate, but that's what he told me. And I said, okay, let's not worry about it. And I've never worried about it since. And that client is ranked number one and, and or number two for just about every keyword I've optimized for, even though the display address is different than what all the, NA, the citations are, um, if that makes sense. Because again, in the in the in the dashboard, in the background, Google has it saved correctly, but the displayed is still displaying it the old way. And so and it's never caused an NAP issue for me. So it stands to for me, it stands to reason that having that additional phone number saved in the dashboard, Google will make that association. But without testing it, I can't say for sure. It's a great question, by the way, Gordon. Um, it's a good one. So if we're giving away t-shirts today, he should probably get one. Just, just saying. Number two, to rank multiple related keywords in YouTube, it used to be that you just uploaded a video for each keyword, making each video a second or so longer than the other videos, and YouTube would think they were all different videos. But I just read that YouTube can now accurately figure out the words in your voiceover. If that is true, how do you now upload copies of the same video for ranking multiple related keywords without tr triggering a duplicate content penalty? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, a lot of the video spinners out there, and that's what they call them, will just like change the encoding. They'll change the quality of like the, the resolution of the video. They'll do like they'll change various things to where it basically looks unique. Um, I haven't heard or seen anything about them checking like the, the audio or the speech within the video. That might be something new, um, which, you know, again, I, I haven't seen that, Gordon. Or read anything about it although i haven't been doing a whole lot of reading about youtube stuff recently so that you know that could be part of it um the only thing i would say is just keep doing what you're doing until it becomes a problem at which point i'm sure there will be plenty of seo develop you know spam tool developers out there that will uh create stuff that will get around it guys anytime google makes a change to stop us from doing stuff it's just a matter of you know weeks before we have new tools and new services out there that will uh, that are you know exploit other loopholes, right? So I wouldn't worry about it right now. Uh, that's a what if question, really, until until you start to experience it. At which point, I'm sure there will be plenty of um, people with solutions. Okay, do you guys have any comment on either of those? No, I, I like it. I'm I'm just thinking how you can just totally trick. YouTube with, with uh, varying the pitch right on, on the voice to a frequency that's not human rec humanly recognized, but it's recognized by the bot. And so that would be a perfect way to, to, uh, to I mean, whoever comes up with that tool, uh, let me know. Uh, I'll, I'll be first in line to buy it. But I mean, it, it would be really simple to, to put uh, voiceover in there to just add a second audio. To, to the video that, that's not recognizable to humans, but it's totally recognizable by the bot. And now you have uh, two distinct audio uh, recordings. Yeah, I'm wondering, in fact, if they have... I'm just curious, because they have video spinners and there's content spinners. I wonder, I'm sure somebody might make an audio spinner, right? Something that would change an audio file uh, to like what Marker just said, different frequencies, different pitches, that kind of stuff that would make it, uh, um, you know, unique. 
that I'm sure if there's not one yet, and that is going to be an issue with YouTube, somebody is going to make one. <laughs> Promise you that. By the way, I'm sure all of you guys are subscribed to a thousand uh, internet marketing developers lists, many of which you probably never subscribed to, but because your email list, you know, you were on an email list that got sold to other marketers, I get them all the time. I get spam emails that I've never subscribed to all the time for stupid warrior forum pro. Uh, or Warrior Plus products and JVZ products and stuff. And I have to unsubscribe all the time. But how many of you guys have been getting like email after email after email about all these new YouTube tools that are coming out, right? Or excuse me, video creation tools. Uh, like, I don't know about you, but it seems like over the last couple of weeks, I just keep getting like, it's like almost daily, there's another video marketing tool that's being launched. And there, every single time, it's another freaking stupid email about it's the next coolest Video marketing tool, it's the easiest thing in the world. Whew. I just get tired of deleting all those emails, guys. <laughs> it's like every, it's a new shiny object every day. And it's like, this one's better than all the other tools on the market. And they say that every day, right? And so I'm just, I'm so fatigued with video marketing tools, guys, that I just delete all those emails now. I'm sure you guys can relate. It just seems like there's a flood of video marketing tools coming out on the market right now. I just, I hope that a, a link. Yeah, Brad, I, I posted a link to Google Cloud so that people can go in and play with uh, speech to text recognition. Cool. Uh, you, you can see how sophisticated Google has gotten. Very cool. Okay, uh, Nigel says, good day, gents. Thank you for all you do for this community. Looking for some assistance on remarketing and setting up tracking. Number one, good training resources for setting up pixels, remarketing, Google, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. If so, please post links. Specifics need general overview. What platforms to target in what order? strategy sm uses um well as far as setting up pixels that's i mean that's just adding code to your site right i recommend always using google tag manager for that stuff i love tag manager it's it's freaking awesome it's so cool because you can do so many amazing things with tag manager not just adding pixels but so many other things and for that i would recommend this i send people to this guy all the time i should ask him if he's got a uh <laughs> affiliate program this, this guy's name is Julian, and um, his website's called measureschool.com, guys. He's got some free training. Um, wow, is this like a – how do you exit out of this damn thing? See, maybe you just got to click in here somewhere. Anyways, measureschool.com. I'll put the link on the page. Um, he's got some free training courses with just an opt-in you can get, and he's also got several courses on uh, Udemy or Udemy or however the hell you say that. Um, and he's really, really good. Like I learned, I just got his Google Tag Manager course. I think it's a free course that I got that just, just specifically to learn how the basics of Tag Manager. But he goes into great like advanced Tag Manager stuff that can be done with it, which is really cool. Uh, it's a lot of real geeky stuff that I don't, I'm not going to, I'm probably never going to implement because it's way over and above my pay grade. <laughs> but uh, but he's he, you can tell this guy, Julian, he's a total um, data nerd. And, and he's, you know, he's, uh, he's proud to admit it. So I, I highly recommend that you go check out whatever resources he has available. Let me just post this on here. This is, um, yeah, look, Andy says, I'm, um, I've been getting bombarded with video spam tools, right, Andy, or video creation tools. Yeah, it's, uh, I've seen a lot of those recently. I don't know why measure school. So anyways, I would go check that out guys. Um, He's got, like I said, some free courses that I've been through that are or at least the tag manager course. He's also got some analytics training that is like super advanced stuff that you can do. Like, I don't know about you guys, but analytics has always been confusing to me other than just basic, um, you know, traffic tracking. Uh, but he goes into all kinds of great detail on how to do all, all kinds of stuff. So I'd, I'd go check that out. As far as um, remarketing like strategy, that's probably going to be more of a Hernan question. Hernan, are you still on? Yeah, I'm here. Um, so in, in terms of remarketing, what we're basically doing, Nigel, is, uh, you know, the the cheapest the cheapest type of traffic that you can run right now, no matter what you're doing in terms of remarketing for Facebook or AdWords, whatever, is the remarketing tar uh, traffic because the, the, the most expensive visitor is the first visitor, if that, if that makes sense. So, yeah, so that... Uh, you know that you need to have that in mind, like getting a visitor back to a page. It's the best way to, you know, to increase your ROI, well, pretty much. The way we are doing it in Semantic Mastery, 
it's pretty pretty straightforward we have a lot of video viewers on youtube so we retarget video viewers we do have organic visit visits to semantic mastery's page so we do retarget them on adwords and facebook because we have the facebook ad and the adwords pixel installed on on the website and then we run traffic from facebook to the blog post we do some video views um we do some video views campaigns on facebook as well and and we remarket we we remarket everyone like everyone into the top of the funnel uh, top of funnel uh, entry points or funnel entry points like the beta plan or you know the the IFTTT recipes etc cetera, etc. Cetera. We talked a little bit about remarketing on um, local ads for Facebook. We will probably be touching base as well when it comes to video ads yeah. uh, because I think that that video ads has to do you know video ads is a, is one of the best way at least on Facebook and I think on Google, on YouTube too but it's one of the best way to build a big audience fast by cheap, really cheap. So uh, we're gonna be touching base back on that on the, um, on on the mastermind as well. But that's basically how we're doing. We're we're getting traffic through you know several entry points, and then we retarget them all into specific funnels that we have predetermined to for cold traffic or remarketing traffic, if that makes sense. Yeah. So. So a couple things just quickly. Uh, we're, we're we're also remarketing via you. He's, he was talking about Facebook and video views, but just to clarify, we are also doing YouTube remarketing and also Google Display Network remarketing, which is banner ads. Um, so guys, just keep in yes. mind those, those are all the different. We use Facebook, YouTube, and GDN Google yep. Display Network for remarketing right now. Um, are we yes. using anything like Perfect Audience or AdRoll or anything? Uh, we're using AdRoll. Uh, we're using AdRoll not as much as not not a lot because uh, you know usually with Facebook and Google and GDN we're usually good. But here's the thing: um, you can retarget people that have watched a video and you can follow him around on, on like on the GDN, you know, the Google Display Network, and then you can follow him around on Facebook as well, and vice versa. Like they don't like they can watch a YouTube video and then they see a banner surfing around. Or if they have watched a video on YouTube, they, they get a banner on Facebook. So you, we're kind of all over the place, and you will get that. Like we got, yeah. uh, we got that a lot on um, the Funny Hacking Live uh, event that Adam and I were were there. Uh, we got that, that a lot. Like you know, hey guys, I saw a video from Semantic Mastery or I attended a hangout, and awesome. now you're popping up all over all over my place. So yeah, I think that was pretty cool. So short answer, Nigel, the shit works. By the way, um, yes, we market heavy have like go hard go very aggressive with remarketing in fact um i started adding like i said more training to the prospecting module in the mastermind nigel and i know you're in the mastermind and uh we're going to be talking up for the prospecting funnels we're going to be talking about how like because i'm going to be really aggressive with remarketing for you know people that we drive into the funnel um the prospecting funnel so and and i'm getting pretty granular as to where they've exited the funnel so that the message, the, se the messaging um, sequence would be, you know, very specific to where they exited the funnel, and so all of that will be covered uh, in great detail in the prospecting funnel build out, which is the training that I'm I'm, I'm starting back up just now. So, uh, just pay attention to that, Nigel. And those are some great questions we can cover more in the mastermind um, webinars too. Uh, I'll try to answer this next one quickly because we're seem like we're pretty far behind today, guys. Are there any major pitfalls I should be aware of when setting up pixels or remarketing specifics? Any known conflicts with analytics, tracking, and affiliate links, link shorteners like Rebrandly? Well, here's my thoughts on that. Again, I'm not the remarketing expert uh, that that um, Hernan is, but typically pixels are going to fire on a page load, right? So when somebody lands on a page, now there are things like Rebrandly and or I know there's uh, like Snipply and things like those types of link shorteners that you can inject a remarketing pixel into the actual link itself, the redirect URL it goes into like the header uh, of the actual URL itself. So you can do that, but most of the time you're going to end up having your remarketing pixels on the pages that you're directing people to, unless you're directing people to pages that you don't have access to through like a Snipply or a Rebrandly link, which in that case, maybe Hernan can shed some light on that. But uh, as far as the type of remarketing that I'm doing, it's typically on an asset. Like I cookie somebody when they land on one of the assets that I have control over. So that's how I can manage. And that doesn't ever cause any conflicts with analytics um, or uh, tracking and affiliate links and things, at least from, from my experience. If you're using the redirect URLs and injecting a uh, pixel into that, then that might cause some issues. What do you think, Renan? Yep, sorry, I was, I was muted. Um, yeah, I totally agree. They're mostly designed for them to work. 
and it's actually adding scripts to a page, right? So once they load, um, once they load, they will fire everything. Like you're adding scripts, and even further, when you have the, if you're doing analytics with remarketing on Google, you can you can even use the re, the analytics code to gather a remarketing audience, if that makes sense. So that you know that's really integrated. And even for the if you're using Google Tag Manager, that would be that would make things so much easier. But it all comes down to um, loading the page. If the page doesn't load, it doesn't matter what you do. If the page did not load, and some um, ad blockers will actually block some cookies, so you need to have that in mind. But uh, and for most cases, you don't need to worry about it because if people are actually surfing your website, they're getting cookies. So I, I wouldn't sweat it initially of conflicts and whatnot. If you're doing things. Like if you're installing the code on the header or the footer of the website. That's why we recommend, for example, on Facebook, we recommend doing actual view content campaigns and not click campaigns because usually you will get a click, but the pixel will not load because people will exit, you know, earlier or whatever. So, but yeah, usually there's no, not a big deal. And um, Nigel, if you if you want for us to try to go in a little bit more in depth, we're having a mastermind webinar tomorrow. So if you want to repost via the uh, mastermind questions form, some of the stuff that we didn't get to here, we got to move on, buddy. Um, we're certainly happy to spend some more time with you tomorrow during the mastermind webinar. Lastly, guys, he mentions here that he's a writer looking to connect with anyone interested in Sweat Equity Partner for GMB Pro or other content posting and process documentation. If interested, please reach out. By the way, if I could plus one this again, I would, Nigel, because that's what we really encourage more of you guys to do is to put put out what you're good at and what you lack or like what you're not good at and try to form jv joint ventures with other members that you guys because two heads can usually accomplish a lot more than one right and so you, you can complement each other's skills uh that way and actually produce a, a joint venture or a partnership agreement where you can grow your businesses or complement each other like help each other out and that's basically how we got started semantic mastery guys like so again that i i really like that you posted that there nigel and I would encourage more of you guys to do that, not just on Hump Day Hangouts, but even in the in the groups too. You know, say what you're good at, say what you're not good at, and say, look, if there's any potential for us to, for for anybody in this group that wants to, uh, kind of exchange ideas and maybe, um, do some part, you know, some projects together or whatever. Like guys, there's a there's a great opportunity for you to be able to build and scale your businesses so much quicker that way, right? So just keep that in mind. Instead of having to learn how to do everything yourself and have to become an expert at everything yourself, find other people that are good at things you're not good at, and the two of you can complement each other and grow your businesses quicker that way. Does that make sense? So anyways, that's awesome, Nigel. Appreciate that. Quit this house says, good day, and thanks for sharing so openly every Wednesday. It's great. Appreciate it. Can, you Google my can the Google My Business website just be a 2,000-word article about my business, and how can I help my clients? Then on other pages, expand on each service I offer and the benefits to the clients, or is that too much? The Google My Business website only is only one page. There, there aren't pages. Um, it's one page. And so I would recommend, yeah, putting good content on the page, but then the way that you add or update content is through the GMB posts. And that, that does it automatically. You just add posts and it will automatically add the posts to the actual GMB website. But at least as it stands right now, as far as I know, unless Marco can, unless Marco uh, corrects me here, the GMB website is one page. It's a single page site, Bradley. So, so what I would recommend is, um, you know, if you're gonna, if you need to have a, a website, a, an external website where you've got pages, which I'm not saying don't do that, guys. We we talked about the GMB Pro Court uh, training or method where you could stay entirely inside the GMB. Uh, dashboard, right? And that's fine. You can, but there is certainly a benefit still to having an external website so that you can do what you're talking about here. List your services, have into, you know, categories and silos if you need to, and all that other kind of stuff. So that's what I would recommend an external website for. Okay. All right. Scott's up. What's up, Scott? He says, I'm setting up a lead gen account that will include website, AdWords, and GMB. I will be using a tracking phone number to monitor activity. Any tips on how to use the tracking phone number with the GMB account? This is a very similar question to the earlier one. Should I use the tracking phone number as the primary phone number and then use the client's business phone number as the secondary number? Thanks much. Yeah, it, look, Scott, if you're setting this up like for the first time, 
then yeah, absolutely. I would recommend using the tracking number for all your NAP stuff. You can always add, if you've got a service provider or a client, if you're setting up a lead gen property or asset for a client and they have their original business number that you want to include as a secondary number, yeah, you can do that. But I would absolutely, if you're setting up a new listing from scratch that you're going to be managing, whether you own the asset or the client owns the asset, it doesn't matter. If you're going to be managing it and you uh, can get the client to agree, if it's a client or if it's your asset, they don't even have to agree, right? Because it's yours. Uh, I would absolutely recommend using a tracking number. Okay. If it is, if you're setting it up for a client, I would still recommend that you use a tracking number so that you can quantify your results to the client and then have their number as a secondary number. All right. Okay. Uh, Glacia. I don't know how to pronounce that. So forgive me <laughs> for butchering that. With syndication networks, do internal links pointing to the money site have a negative effect on the syndicated content? No, because it's a citation, right? I, it, that's that's essentially what it is. You're, you're citing the source. It's an attribution link, which is required to, to, to be, uh, well, here's the thing. If it's your own content and you're republishing it, you're not triggering uh, DM, you're, it's not a DMCA violation right? Technically, because it's your own content that you're republishing. But typically, if you're going to republish somebody else's content, you're not supposed to republish the whole work or the whole piece. Anyways, you're only supposed to republish a portion or a snippet of it, but you're always supposed to cite the source. Um, and that's to be within DMCA compliance, as well as it's just the right and ethical thing to do, right? To, to, to give credit to the source. So, yeah, no, it's not. It doesn't create a problem. Um, and and in fact, the whole point of us syndicating the content is to be able to create that backlink back to the original source, which is our own money site, right? So no, it does not have a negative effect. Richard says, if my client has a GMB page with existing photos, is there a way to add the XF data to the photos without downloading and re-uploading them? I don't think so. But Marco, do you have any? Uh... No, no. What we have, you have to download the images so, so that you can rename and play with the exit data. What I would say is if the client did it, it's likely that he did it either from home or he or she or from the business or from things surrounding the business or whatever. So you actually want that because that's really good in local information on those images already. Unless they were stock Ooh. photos. Uh, on, uh, yeah, unless it, it was stock garbage that, or, or that he, you know, unless he grabbed them from, from the web and he didn't know what he was doing, then you can get into a lot of trouble with uh, those extortionists. Uh, I, I, I right. forget them, but I, I can't, I Getty don't mess. This is one of them. There you go. They're, yep. fucking, they're extortionists, man. Yep. But other than that, no, you, it, ask your client, you know, where the images came from. If, if they came uh, from his phone and, and you have all that local information. You don't need anything else. You actually have a, a little gold mine there that you can reuse. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I have trouble getting the clients to, even though they all say, oh, yeah, we'll get you some photos. I have, I'm just, it's like pulling teeth, getting my clients to give me photos. So I just set up my VA with a stock fresh account and she just goes in and pulls uh, stock photos. And then she basically renames the file names and changes the EXIF data, adds geodata all that kind of stuff. And then we upload them. And that's just because, again, I, I, even the clients that swore up and down, they'd get me photos. Not a one of them has sent me any damn photos. It's ridiculous. So uh, I just gave up. <laughs> it's hard to get clients to do, to, to, to contribute or to participate. I don't know why. David Kennedy says, I am loving GMB Pro and I have two questions. Well, that's awesome. First of all, Question one about the meta refresh. I have a friend who did this on a sites.google.com and got everything banned down to and, and including his Gmail. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? First of all, um, it's funny that you say that because I, I didn't think, I know Marco had figured that out a while back too. And um, Peter Drew has a, 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 a product out right now that actually integrates with his um, Google Sites generator that adds the meta refresh to the Google Sites. So I don't know how he's getting away with it because you're, that's uh, I, I haven't played with that software, guys. Honestly, I just haven't had time. I've been overwhelmed with local GMB Pro and the mastermind training stuff. So I don't have time to play with any software right now at all. However, I know that he's recently launched that software that integrates with the Google Sites Generator that does exactly that. It creates Google Sites in mass and then it adds a meta refresh redirect to them so that the Google Sites rank, but when someone clicks on it, 
it redirects to whatever destination URL they want. That's totally against terms of service as far as I know. But um, and so, again, I can understand why it might have got a, an account banned. Somehow his tool is still doing that. And Peter's tools are I'm a big fan of Peter's tools, guys, just in case you didn't, weren't aware of that. Peter Drew's tools are really, really good. So uh, even though I haven't had a chance to play with it, I would like to. Um, so I'm not sure uh, why. I mean, again, it's probably against terms of service. Marco, I know you had figured it out, but you don't use it. Is it because of that reason? No, I, I do use it. I'm okay. just really careful that I'm not seen as a, as a fishing site, pH fishing, right? Where I'm, I'm going from a contact form to another place that holds a contact form. That's a big freak, freaking no-no. And yes, you'll get everything taken down, down to your pants, man. They'll get you for that because that's, that's fishing. You're going to another contact form somewhere else. You're taking people. It, 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 that's seen as, as a trick to get their information. Now, I've seen literally a, a website with thousands of pages. Uh, and I don't know <laughs> how they did it. Uh, Peter Software wasn't out yet. But, I mean, just hundreds and thousands of pages. Made a refresh over to uh, pages on the main website with, without any issues. So it, it's just the, the page that, that you met a refresh. You have to be really careful what that page is about. Since our pages are usually just iframes, we have really no issues with the, with the meta refresh. I mean, I, I've, I talked to Rob back and forth, and our G sites are mainly that, right? just content and uh, just a bunch of iframes. And no, no problems. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. Question number two, is there any viable use for crowdsearch.me anymore? I'm considering dropping it unless there is a use for it in some way. Thanks in advance. Yeah, um, I, I canceled my subscription several months ago, guys. Um, you know, there is still a benefit to using it in some situations, like for referral traffic through social media. Um, or also, like if you have the, – the problem is credits are, are expensive over there. And so, like I've used it in the past uh, – yeah, I, I was on a 50,000 credit per month plan. And so, you know, over time, I didn't always use all my credits. And I had actually backed up something like 400 and some thousand credits. So when I canceled my subscription, I, I bet I had built up over time because I had been using that tool for damn near three years, I think. Um, and so one of the things that I was doing with it was sending traffic to press releases as part of the way to get PRs to stick, right? And, and and all that's covered in the local PR pro training on ways to get the press releases to stick. And one of the ways is to send traffic to it. And so I would send crowd search traffic to it. But remember, I had, you know, hundreds of thousands of credits. So I would ramp it up to where I'd send, you know, dozens of views per day to that PR um, so that it would help it to stick in the search results and not start to slip after a few days or a couple of weeks or whatever, depending on how competitive the term was. However, there's Fiverr gigs that you can buy for five bucks or 10 bucks or even 15 bucks, whatever, to send traffic that has the same effect. And it doesn't have and, and it doesn't require a monthly subscription. It's just a gig. You know what I mean? And then you could just re up the gig once a month or whenever you start to see it drop. And so the short answer is yeah, you can still use CrowdSearch in some respects without it I, I just wouldn't run it to my money site guys anymore at all because a lot of those ct spam tools have been like the ip ranges have been flagged and all that kind of stuff and a lot of that traffic is just disregarded it's just not counted now we know because we spent six figures trying to develop a tool to do it and i'm not I'm not kidding and, and we weren't able to we weren't able to do it in any way that we would want to sell to you guys and that's why we never launched it we never launched our traffic service specifically because we did a ton of testing. I mean, we spent a lot of fucking money, by the way, on this, and we were not able to get it to something that we thought we felt comfortable as selling as a service. And that's why we don't use it ourselves anymore. And we didn't provide it or, uh, you know, um, ever um, launch it to you guys. Right. And so we're out a lot of money over it. But my point is, I don't think it's a good idea because there's other ways like I would rather spend the money and the time setting up micro task workers to do it. And even that's not even all that great anymore. It's still better than uh, nothing, you know, as far as being able to spam traffic. But there's it's just not something that I would recommend doing. So as far as I, David, if you're not using it, 
the right way through like referral traffic and stuff like that, then I would say cancel it. Your your money's probably better spent somewhere else. Okay. Marco, you want to comment on that? Yeah. The, the problem with, with, with fake traffic and micro task workers are, as, as you uh, refer to, it's user agents, re repeated user agents, repeated uh, IP blocks, right? because they buy IPs that, that, that they send these people through. And if you do that over and over and over, it, I mean, it, it's just a big footprint. It doesn't, it doesn't matter who it is. And additionally, a bot cannot mimic a real person, nor can a micro task worker, because you're giving a micro task gotcha. worker a, yeah. a set of rules that they have to apply over and over and over again. And so they're only going to do what they're instructed to do, whereas a real person, I mean, yeah, think about it. Th think, of it think of it as an end user. Sometimes you're, you're in the middle of something and your, your kid falls, so you, so you walk away. And you come back. How do you mimic that? How do you mimic that in, into whatever it is that that you're trying to produce, whatever effect, whatever analytics and metrics you're trying to feed the bot? How do you account for that? How do you account for the human factor? Well, the only way to account for it is through humans, not not but not micro task workers. Micro task workers are humans assigned to do a specific task. This is what we're seeing from our our, our YouTube users, where we where we pull real people. They come in, they act like real people, they interact with the channel in a natural way, and, and it just sends the, the signals that, that Google is looking for. It's people interacting, they're giving likes, they're giving, they're subscribing, you know, they, they're, they're commenting on your videos. But the thing that we found, and this goes back to, to the spam videos that, that somebody talked about, if you use spam videos, don't expect to get much action on a spam video. You have to make sure if you're sending real traffic to a video, you have to make sure that that video is quality and will convert or else you're just wasting your time either e either way because now what we're seeing we're not concentrating so much on rankings right what we're concentrating on is generating traffic wherever it is that we want them to go yeah and i was just scrolling through because we got to wrap up here guys and i'm going to answer a couple more questions with some pretty cool things um Awesome. Yeah, Gabe, that's really cool. Uh, Gabe reached out to Nigel, said, I'm going to go Google Tag Manager Ninja. See, that's what I'm talking about, guys. This is I'm telling you guys, create JVs with uh, other members. That's how you um, can grow your business really quickly, guys. Um, all right, let's just go through. Guys, I'm, I'm going to answer questions up to this image posted by Greg. Uh, and then we got to wrap it up because I got uh, my daughter has a softball game tonight I'm going to. So let me answer this one. David says, one more question. Any thoughts on GDPR for sites in the U.S. and PBN sites, which can be anywhere? Mixed information on the subject. Yeah, David uh, referred to the answer earlier about GDPR stuff. Um, I would just wait for a bit until the dust settles and there's more clarity on what to do. Um, I don't. I certainly don't have the answers. Um, Hernan gave some pretty good answers. Chris, our partner Chris, who's displayed over here, looking like a <laughs> somebody from the 70s. Uh, anyways, uh, he he's a he's well versed on that. So, you know, over the next couple of weeks, several weeks, whatever, we should have some better answers right now. I would just recommend that you just wait till the dust settles a bit. By the way, GMB pro methods are making a difference already in two clients. Thank you for this training. Plus one. See guys, it's almost overnight. You can get results. It's insane. Greg says, what is the breakdown of search traffic and percentage these days? For example, the rule was always number one, got roughly 42, blah, 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 with a strong presence on maps. How is search traffic distributed between one, two, and three? That's a great question, Greg. I have no answer for that at all. Um, I bet you Moz or Search Engine Journal or one of those probably has an article on it somewhere. So I would just do some Google searches for those type of statistics and you'll likely find your answer. That's not something I know off the top of my head. That's good statistic to know. And by the way, Greg, if you find the answer to that, and uh, it's in like an infographic form or in a, you know, a chart in one of the articles that you find that will answer that question. Please share that with us in the mastermind or wherever, because that's something that we could use in our presentations when we're pitching clients, right? Think about that. That's stuff that we should know. Um, I should know that. I just use outdated <laughs> statistics. That's all because the business owner isn't going to go do the research. But if we have, if you do find something updated, let us know so that I can update my presentations, right? I'm going to actually I'm going to post a link with with the information that, that Greg requested. It's it's really interesting what's happening now that things are moving to mobile. And so it's something it's something really good to look at. I'm not gonna get in depth in depth into the article. You can read it, Greg, but everything you need is in that article. Yeah. 
Okay, Jim says, hey, SM gang, thanks for the weekly webinars. My question revolves around Peter Drew's Google Site Generator. Hey, imagine that. We were just talking about it. When did you when you did the webinar with Peter, you said you hadn't had the time to fully test use the program in the past 10 months or so. Did you look into it any further? If so, do you implement Google Sites Generator? Do you did you implement into your workflow? Any further thoughts on it? Thanks for your time. No, I I didn't really work it into my workflow. Um, as far as testing and stuff, there really wasn't any additional testing to do for me. I just used it. Um, I, I, I've talked many times over the past 10 months about how I use it. It's not something that I even have a VA running. Uh, most of Peter's tools I run myself because they're simple, right? Part of the reason I don't like running SEO software guys is because there's there's usually a huge learning curve with them. And I don't have the time for that or the patience, to be honest with you. I just don't. Um, I got... I had to learn how to use SE Nuke years ago. When I first got in the SEO game, I, I used SE Nuke a lot and it was a hell of a learning curve. And I hated running that tool. It was effective, but I absolutely hated running that tool. So once I got my business to a point where I didn't need to do that anymore, I hired Dedia from Upwork part-time because he was he had a full-time job at the time. He's our link building manager. Um, and I hired him. And within a few months, six months or so, I ended up hiring him full time so he could quit his job and go full time in the link building. And now he runs his own company with a team of link builders and all kinds of other SEO services. It's amazing how that guy's grown. His business has grown over the years. Um, so anyways, my, my point in saying all that is I don't have the patience or the desire to work on any of those, any complicated SEO tools. However, Peter Drew's tools are typically very simple to use, which is why I still run them myself. Um, and it's not something that I integrate into a standard uh operating procedure. It's just something that I play around with when I have time or if I see something that needs a boost. The way that I typically use the Google Sites Generator is to boost a Google site that's part of a drive stack, right? Which is an overall strategy. Uh, you know, drive stacks are part of an overall strategy for, for me, for local, for because, you know, I pretty much primarily do local stuff. So when I order a drive stack, I order a drive stack with a Google site always. I rarely ever get the Twitter syndication network, not because it doesn't work. It's just I'm not a Twitter user, so I don't give a shit about Twitter, <laughs> to be honest with you. Even if it's effective, I just don't use Twitter. So my point is I use the Google Sites and the drive stack, and then I'll use the Google Sites generator to create little mini network of sites that link to the Google site from the, the drive stack, and it helps to just boost that Google site. Um, and that, and then, you know, obviously we do all the iframe stuff, the local iframe loop stuff that we taught in syndication Academy, plus a lot of the other stuff that we talk about with iframes and Google properties. And all of that seems to have a really good effect because you're using Google properties to rank to other rank other Google properties. Right. So, um, again, Jim, it's a great product. Um, I highly recommend all of Peter's tools because, you know, for, for, for spam tools, they're easy, they're simple, uh, and they work. So, um, you know, I still use it, but it's not something that is like in my standard operating procedure. It's just kind of like when I see something that I think I can boost, uh, I'll, I'll run a campaign and I'll build some sites with some content, blah, blah, blah. OK. All right. Last question, guys. And if I, I, yeah, if I can just say real quick, sure. the, the way that I do it is since we have a, a script that will copy uh, files and actually folders and files, what I'll do is the, the specific whatever it is that i'm trying to to boost i'll take that that file copy it move it over to to a, a new g site make a mini g site and just connect it to whatever to the page uh, where i'm iframing everything so that i'm boosting the page with g sites made our way not just a, a plain g site i hope i hope that makes sense but it, it's all in ryS reload how, how we can set up and copy folders and files and, and add them elsewhere, wherever we want. Yeah. Paul's up. He says, hey, guys, I'm trying to create recipes for a Twitter trigger to post my GMB page posts. I created a Twitter RSS feed and connected all the network properties. I have everything working ex with the exception of Blogger and WordPress. You guys have any suggestion making those two work with Twitter trigger? No, because as I just mentioned in the previous uh, answer to Jim Wells' question, I don't, I'm just not a Twitter user. I, honestly, I... I I mean, I still put them in our syndication networks and stuff, but I just, I've never had any desire to do anything on Twitter. Just like I very rarely have any desire to do anything on Facebook. Uh, it's just, I just don't desire to do it. So I don't have any, um, I, Paul, it's something that if you want, um, I could make a note of that for the next syndication Academy update webinar to play around with that a little bit and see if I can figure it out for you. Typically guys, when, when somebody has a problem or a question like this, that's all I do is just go in and I'll spend a couple hours in IFTTT testing different 
um, configurations to see if I can get it to work. And then once I figure it out, I tell you guys about how I did it. Um, so again, Paul, I would, you know, I assume that you've been testing through trial and error, trying to get it to work and you haven't been able to figure it out. If you'd like for me to try it, just say the word, uh, you know, tag me in a post in the Facebook group for syndication Academy, ask me to do so. And I, I'll, uh, I'll put it on the list for the next update webinar. I don't have any answers for you though. Marco, have you had any problems syndicating from Twitter to blogger or WordPress? Yeah, I don't usually do it through Twitter or RSS feed. I do it with hashtag controllers and that works really well. Okay. So if if Twitter with specific hashtag, then uh, uh, post to blogger and post. So you're to doing WordPress. a direct Twitter trigger channel. Correct. Okay, so you're not using. So he's not doing an RSS two applet. He's Paul. He's doing a a Twitter two applet. Does that make sense? So instead of setting is your trigger an RSS up, try setting up Twitter as the actual trigger trigger instead of Twitter being uh, instead of, excuse me instead of an RSS feed. And try that. And I, I don't know if you've tested that yet, but that's what I would do. Um, in fact, yeah, I kind of missed that whole RSS thing because, yeah, typically any sort of Twitter triggers, guys, I do direct from Twitter, not from an RSS feed. That makes sense. Okay. Which, again, I ver do very little with Twitter anymore. So, <clears throat> okay. I think we're about done. Uh, uh, by, by the way, just b before we go, guys, any of you who are in local GMB Pro, we're setting up a Facebook group so you guys can go in and, and ask questions. You'll be updated when the content is updated, and you'll know when uh, when we are having update webinars. Yeah. I so that's uh, next week. I think Adam wanted us to wait until Monday to announce that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, GMB Pro Buyers, uh, we, are, we, we just set up a Facebook group for it today. Please don't ask for access before Monday of next week because we're, we're going to get everybody installed in, into the group next week, okay? Yeah, we're not inviting people this week. It will be done Monday Yeah, or sometime next week. And last thing is uh, – Andy asks, when we'll be offering the GMB posting service, the auto poster. Uh, we've got beta testers in there now. Um, when do you think we're going to fully launch it? Do you know, Marco? I would say within the next two weeks. Okay. So within two weeks, guys, we should have. we got beta testers in there now. It's working. So as soon as we get, we make sure that we, we're, we're getting in there, people in there now to try to break it, right? So that we can fix it, squash any bugs, basically. So uh, as soon as we get the bug squash, it'll be available to you guys. All right? Okay, cool. Awesome, guys. We appreciate everybody being here. Happy uh, hump day. Got it. See you guys next week. Mastermind Bye, everyone. We got a mastermind webinar, so don't forget. See you, guys. Bye.